A while back, Ann Landers had an article, and in this particular article, uh, she gave some excuses that automobile drivers have actually given for the accidents they were involved in. These excuses I'm going to share with you are from actual insurance reports. Here's a few of them. One driver said, a pedestrian hit me and went under my car. Another driver said, this guy was all over the place. I had to swerve a number of times before I hit him. Another driver said, the accident occurred when I was attempting to bring my car out of a skid by steering into the other vehicle. The last one I have here, it says, the pedestrian had no idea which direction to go, so I ran him over. You know, I think most all of us recognize a lame excuse when we hear one. And that got me to thinking about God and what all God hears. Can you imagine the excuses that God must hear on a daily basis? When maybe He's calling people to surrender their life to Him, or maybe He's impressing upon someone that they need to get involved in some type of ministry, or maybe He's reminding someone some way of the gifts they have, and He expects them to use them for Him. Imagine all the excuses that God must hear. Our reading last week, uh, one of our readings from last week's thematic reading through the Bible, I hope you're keeping up with that. I'm going to go back to the book of Exodus, to Moses. I think you would agree with me that Moses is a key figure in the Old Testament. I mean, he, he's a pivotal figure. He leads the people out of Egypt. And he goes up on Mount Sinai and you know, receives the Ten Commandments. You know, the first five books in the Bible are attributed to him. And so Moses is a key figure. And this may surprise you, but initially, when God commissioned Moses and called him to a task, Moses responded with excuses. Not just one excuse, not just two excuses, not just three excuses, but four excuses. If you'll remember, Moses is out tending his flocks. He sees a bush that's burning in a distance. And he notices as he looks at this bush that it's not being consumed. So he's surprised. He goes over to the bush and out of this glowing, crackling, burning bush, God speaks to him. And God essentially says to Moses, I want you to lead my people out of Egypt. Keep in mind they're in Egypt. They are being uh, enslaved by the Egyptians and they're making bricks for all these construction projects. And they've been groaning under this burden that the Egyptians have placed upon them. And God is now ready to bring them out of Egypt and ultimately bring them into the promised land that he promised to Abraham. So God commissions Moses from the burning bush. What I would like for us to do this morning is kind of take a look at Moses' four excuses. Let's take a look at Exodus chapter 3. And we'll start here with uh, verse 11. Exodus chapter 3. Verse 11. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? I'm going to paraphrase that as simply this I am not qualified. Who am I? To bring these people out. He thinks this is above his pay grade, so to speak. This is not something that he feels qualified for. And I know on this side of history, we look at it and say, you got this, Moses. You can do it. We know you can do it. But right then and there, he's tending the flocks. You know, he sees the burning bush. He's been basically living out in the wilderness for 40 years. And here God's commissioning him to go and lead the people out. And he simply doesn't feel up to the task. So I'm going to say this excuse is I'm not qualified. Now this leads me to wonder why does he not feel qualified? I mean, what, what was it about himself that he didn't feel up, up to the task? You know, why, why didn't he feel good enough to lead the people out of Egypt? I can only speculate. One, one could be that his occupation was that of being a shepherd. And Egyptians looked down on shepherds for some reason. We don't know exactly why. I suppose it's because they were so, uh, shall I say, 
hygienically challenged. They weren't the cleanest people in the world. Uh, they stayed outdoors a lot of the time. And I don't know if you've been around any goats or not, but there's a smell associated with goats, and I guess that smell would get on them at times. And they just weren't the cleanest people in the world. So, so they were sort of looked down upon by some people. So keep in mind, here is, especially the Egyptians, I mean to the Egyptians, they were on the lowest rung of the social ladder. So, so, so here is Moses being asked by God to, to leave this station of as low as you can go, to go all the way up and go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go, essentially. So God's asking him to go from the lowest rung of the ladder all the way up to the tallest rung of the ladder and tell that guy up there that you want to lead the people out. Maybe, maybe Moses just felt, you know, I'm just not good enough, we'll say, socially for this task. You may think, what are you, what are you exactly talking about, John? I think people today sometimes uh, ignore God's call in their life for a very, very same reasons. I mean, some people feel like, well, you know, God could never use me. You, you just don't know my family. I mean, I have some real characters in my family. I, God could never, maybe it's from a, a poor background, you know, never had much money, maybe suffer, suffer some low self-esteem uh, but because of that. Uh, maybe they don't, uh, you know, feel adequate because of their social status in the world. But keep in mind, Jesus, the Lord Jesus himself, was born in a barnyard. Now that's about as low on the social rung as you can get. Wouldn't you agree? Born in a barnyard. That's about as humble as a beginning as you can have. Furthermore, you may not have realized this, but Jesus had a prostitute in his family tree named Rahab. Does that shock you? You see, God can take people from all kinds of families and use them. You could have the most rotten family in the world, and God can take you and use you. you. You can be as low as it goes on the social ladder. You can be a homeless person, and God can still use you. So don't ever let this, I'm not good enough, enter into your mind when it comes to God calling you to step out and do something for Him. I mean, as a Christian person especially, you shouldn't let your uh, self-esteem hold you back. I mean, keep in mind, according to the Bible, that we're citizens of heaven. I can't think of anything any better than that when it comes to citizenship. You belong to the household of faith. That means you're part of God's family, child of God. The Bible says we're part of a royal priesthood. Royal. I don't know if you've ever thought about that or not, but in God's sight, if you're a Christian, He sees you as royalty. You know, like, like a king and a queen and prince, etc. I mean, God, once we come into His family, uh, we become royalty in His sight. And I think that should give us all the self-esteem we need to do whatever He puts before us. What do y'all think? No question about it. You know, maybe Moses didn't feel morally qualified. After all, he had murdered an Egyptian earlier in life. We know that much. He sees this Egyptian guy, you know, beating up on one of his fellow Hebrews, and so what's Moses do? He just goes out there and kills a guy and buries him in the sand. That's what got him in trouble in the first place, and it was seen, and it became known he has to get, get out of Egypt. So he's, he's about 40 at the time, so he goes and lives in the land of Midian, and he's there about 40 years. But, but what I want you to see here is that Moses, uh, he had literally kill somebody. There may have been other things that Moses did. And I'm thinking, well, you know, maybe, maybe that made him feel a little inadequate. You know, people today let things a lot less than that hold them back. Well, I, I, I had someone tell me, he said, oh, you just don't know my past, man. My, my, my past is so dark. You wouldn't, you know, it's like, hey, look, God is in the forgiving business. God can take people, even though their sins are as scarlet, he can make them as white as snow. I love that verse in the Bible that says He separates our sin from us as far as the east is from the west. That's figuratively saying once you go to God in repentance and ask for forgiveness, He forgives us and it's gone and over with. Many times, though, we can't forgive ourselves. And because of things we've done in the past, we sort of want to hold on to those things for some warped reason and allow that uh, to hold us back 
when it comes to maybe accepting God's call on our life in the first place, just giving our life to Him. Or once we've become a Christian, sometimes we, we allow that to hold us back from really serving Him and moving out and doing the kind of things He puts before us. So don't ever let your past hold you back. Paul said he was the chiefest of sinners. You know, he persecuted the church, and yet God saved him. And he uses that, that very example to let people know that God's grace covers our sin if we'll only give our lives to Him. So I want to encourage you this morning, don't let your, your past, no matter how bad it is, hold you back. Here God has taken a murderer and said, I want you to lead my people. But Moses just doesn't feel up to it. There's another reason Moses may not have felt qualified. As I mentioned earlier, he's about 80 years old at this time. Maybe he had retirement on his mind. What do y'all think? I mean, at 80, you're going to be ready to retire? I mean, I'll feel fortunate if I'm still around at 80. And here God's given this monumental task to this guy at 80 years of age. Wow. If you're one of these Christians and you think you've reached the age of retirement where God can't use anymore, think again. God does some of his best work with seasoned citizens. And that's what we see here with Moses. He's 80 years old. Maybe he doesn't feel up to the task. I'm not qualified, God. Find somebody with some more energy. Find somebody that's a, a hustler and go get her and just feel good about themselves. Nope. God says, no, Moses, I want you. Notice what it says in, in verse 12 there of chapter 3. God simply says to him, I will be with you. That's how God comes back with that excuse. I don't feel good enough. I'm not qualified, basically. God said, I'll be with you. Now that's enough, is it not? He says the same thing to us in the New Testament. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. You know, God is there to back us up when, 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 we, when we do sort of fall short and we don't seem to measure up. God takes up the slack. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. God is there. That's what he's telling Moses. You may not feel qualified, but I got you covered, Moses. Let's look at the next excuse. So God knocked that one down, and he'll knock it down in your life as well. Let's look at the, the second excuse he offers in verse 13. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and, they, and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? Paraphrase this one. God, I just don't know enough. Have you ever used that excuse? Maybe you need to invite someone to church or maybe you need to share your faith with somebody but, or maybe get involved in some ministry in the church and you just don't feel like you know enough. So Moses is here telling God, I, I don't know exactly what your name even is. What, what if they ask me who you are? I'm not even going to be able, I'm not even going to be able to tell them. Isn't it interesting that God's calling him and he still, at this point, he doesn't even know God's name. He just knows him as the God of, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the, the God of his fathers. He doesn't know any more than that. And here God is asking him to go and lead the people out. And eventually he's going to write the first five books of the Bible. But at this time, he doesn't even know what God's name is. How many times have Christians let their lack of knowledge paralyze them from being used by God in a mighty way? Don't let your lack of knowledge hold you back. Christianity is a religion where you learn as you go. If I let lack of knowledge get in the way, I wouldn't even be up here this morning. There's so much more to know. And the more I know, it seems like the more there is to know. And the more you study God's Word, the more you'll realize there's, there's more, even more to know. And there's deeper things to know. So it's a, it's a continually ongoing process. If you are a Christian and you say, I have arrived, I know all I need to know. And you're missing the mark. Because you continually grow, ideally, as you're a Christian, as you go through time and as you get in God's Word and study and develop a relationship with Him, He will teach you. And the Holy Spirit comes in to us too when we first come to him the Holy Spirit's the comforter and the counselor he leads us and directs us and guides us but you can't ever get to the place where you're like well I don't know enough so I'm not going to let God use me notice what God says his name is if you continue reading on through there and I'm, I'm going to kind of hit the high spots here God says tell them I am who I am that, that's his name 
I am who I am. So what does that mean? Well, that name, I am, emphasizes God's timelessness. He's the existing one, the being one, the eternal one, one without beginning or end. Now, some people translate this name as uh, Jehovah. Uh, seems like many scholars today say that's not really the way it's supposed to be said. It's, uh, it's supposed to be uh, Yahweh or something very similar to Yahweh. We don't know exactly because uh, the Jews were afraid to write God's name, so they didn't totally write it all out because they didn't want to take his name in vain. That's how much they revered his name. But putting it all back together, it looks like it was probably Yahweh, when you're reading through your Old Testament, I've told you all this before, and you see the word L-O-R-D in all capital letters, that means Yahweh is behind that name. The same name as I am. I bet some people serving this very day at this church didn't know all that. Maybe a greeter didn't know that when they passed out a bulletin this morning. Maybe the sound guy back there didn't know this. Maybe, maybe the computer person didn't know it. Maybe the people who set the chairs out didn't know this. Maybe the guys in the band didn't know this. You know, I'd like to bring them up here and ask them, but I'm not going to do that. My point is, you don't have to wait until you know everything to start serving God. Again, it is a learn as you go. So don't use that excuse to God. God, I, I don't know enough. Of course you don't know enough. God's going to help you learn. Okay, let's look at the, the third excuse, chapter 4, verse 1. I love the way God's just knocking the excuses down. Moses answered, What if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, The Lord, see that capital L-O-R-D, The Lord did not appear to you. So we could paraphrase this one as, I may be rejected. Moses was concerned that the people may not believe what he has to say. Now put yourself in Moses' sandals for a few minutes. You're this guy that's been living out in the wilderness for 40 years. You've been tending sheep in these herds. And you're going to come back to the people. And you're going to say, uh, you know, God spoke to me through a burning bush. Now we accept that today because we've heard the story over and over and over again. But imagine how strange that would sound if Someone came to you and said, you know, I was looking at a bush and it was on fire and God started talking to me out of that bush. And here's, here's what he wants us to do. He wants us to leave this country and, and he wants you to follow me out into the wilderness. Now what would you think? Better yet, what's Pharaoh going to think? Here's this man, this guy that's been out around the, the flocks, outdoorsy looking guy, saying God has told me that I'm supposed to bring all these people out of Egypt now. Pharaoh's not too wild about that idea. That's his labor force, cheap labor, free labor. He's not wanting to lose all these people. And here's this guy telling him, you know, God has called me to lead them out. You know, sometimes we let uh, what others may think of us hold us back from doing what God wants us to do. I remember when I, when I went to... Bible college, and I, I told my dad, uh, I still remember his words. He said, son, the nut house is full of religious fanatics. Now, that wasn't exactly the most encouraging thing to say. I mean, I know what he meant by that, but it, it was kind of like, uh, you might be going a little too far with this. And sometimes we, we, we get that. We think, well, you know, if I start talking about the Lord, people are going to think I'm weird. They're going to think I'm strange. Uh, if, I, if, I, if I start uh, going to church uh, more than once or twice a month, people are going to think I'm getting too serious with this thing. If I start going on a Wednesday night or I join a Bible study, they're going to think I'm becoming a, a religious fanatic. And sometimes we, we let what other people think about us hold us back. We even do it in worship sometimes. You know, we really want to raise our hands to God. We want to sing out, may even want to shout, but, but we don't do it because of what other people may think. We're always afraid of you know, being rejected by others. And you know, to, to God, that, that really wasn't a good enough excuse. This brings us to the, to the fourth excuse. Verse 10 of chapter 4. Now, I really think this is a lame excuse, and I'll tell you in a minute why. Moses said to the capital L-O-R-D, Yahweh, 
Oh, Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. I'm like, what's he mean by that? Does he have a speech impediment? Does he stutter? Can you still say tongue-tied or is that incorrect now? You've got to really watch yourself nowadays. Something was wrong with, I guess, his speaking according to him. Now, the, the reason I, I think that is a lame excuse, maybe he did bumble every once in a while. It's real easy to bumble. Do you realize that? You should come up here and try this sometime. It, it's real easy to lose your train of thought or repeat yourself or, or, or whatever. There's all kinds. It's not always easy to, you know, stand in front of people and be Mr. Pulpiteer and, and smooth like Joel Osteen and all that kind of stuff, okay? So maybe M Moses is thinking, you know, I, you know I, I, the words just don't flow out. I'm not, you know, I'm not articulate. I don't know all these adjectives and all this description. You know, I'm just not good at this, Lord. Now, now the reason I think, though, there, there's a little bit of uh, lameness to this excuse is I see Acts chapter 7, verse 22. And Acts chapter 7, verse 22 tells us that Moses was powerful in speech. Hmm. What's going on here? He's saying he's slow of speech and acts like the words just don't come out right, but yet we see in the book of Acts that it wasn't exactly right. Moses was very powerful in speech. You know, he's saying to God, you know, God, I'm just not talented enough, but really, really he was talented enough. And I think we do the same thing today. Sometimes um, God wants to take us and use us in different ways. Sometimes we say, God, I'm, I'm just not uh, gifted enough. I'm not uh, talented uh, enough. But what happens is we, we really sell ourselves short a lot of the times. And by the way, everybody in here has a talent. You know, it's, that's plainly stated in the New Testament. And one day we're going to have to give an account of what we did with our talents. Remember the parable of the guy who buried his talent in the ground, didn't do anything with it. So he's the person who goes through life and never really uses the talents and gifts and abilities and resources and all the things God gave him, he's buried it in the ground. And then on the day of reckoning, what does God call him? He calls him wicked and lazy. So sometimes doing nothing will get you in big trouble, just like doing something wrong will. You know, just burying what you got, what God's given you. If you don't use it and engage it for him, he sees it not only as a form of laziness, we understand that part, but also wickedness. That's kind of shocking, but you can, you can check that parable out. But we sometimes sell ourselves short, though, and, and we can do so much more than we actually do. And the reason we can do so much more than we think we can do is because we've got God with us. We've got God working with us. If we'll surrender ourselves to Him, He can do all kinds of things through us. But we, we have to get out of this mindset of, I'm not talented enough. I could never teach that class. I could never help with those kids. I could never run that soundboard. I could never... Build that or repair that or do there's just all kinds you could go on and on. So many times we just don't feel like we can do it. And maybe that's what Moses is saying here. He's just I'm just not that great of a speaker. I'm not gonna be able to motivate these people. I'm not gonna have the right words, I'm not gonna have the right emotion, I'm not gonna have enough fervor, I'm not gonna be able to galvanize these people and get them together. But God's basically saying, Yeah, you can do it because I'm with you. And I think he says the same thing to us. Whatever talents and abilities he's given you, surrender them to him and watch what God will do. This reminds me of an illustration that I read years ago. I've never tried this. I want to try it, but I've never done it before. It was an illustration about a flea trainer. Like I own a dog, a flea. A flea. You ever seen fleas when they get in the carpet? As you walk by there and you got your shorts on, got your flip-flops on, you ever seen how the fleas react? Start popping like popcorn. You get on your legs and on your feet and start biting you. Well, supposedly there's such a thing as a flea trainer. And the flea trainer gets a cardboard box. Somehow or another gets the fleas in the box. Puts a top on the box. And leaves the fleas in there for a good while. And the fleas are in that box. They're popping, pop, 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 jumping. Psh, 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 psh. And after a while, they get tired of hitting that covering on the top of the box. I guess you could say the fleas get a headache. They get tired of hitting the top of that box. Well, after a while, supposedly, again, I've never tried this. You might want to try this. Let me know if you do. 
But supposedly they say that after a while they'll get tired of hitting the top of that box and then you can take them out of the box and they'll only jump so high. They'll never jump any higher than the top of where that box was covered. Does that make sense? They condition themselves to only jumping so high. Now do you think Christians can sometimes be guilty of that? They only condition themselves to doing so much and they never really get out of the box, so to speak. Just get used to doing just a little bit, just a little bit, just a little bit. May run into a little friction along the way. Might rub elbows with somebody at church that rubs them the wrong way. There might be something where they, where, 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 where they flop. I remember when I first started preaching, some, some guy made some critical comment, and I, I just about wanted to pack it in. I was like, oh, gosh, because it was all I could do to get up there anyway. Didn't need to hear any negative comments. But um, he did, and I just about wanted to quit. But, but it, it's, it's, you know, I guess you could say I hit my head on the top of that box. I could have just stepped away and said, can't jump any higher than that. And, and that can happen as, to Christians too. We, we might step out and start to do something and then only get so far and never really begin to jump and begin to do the things God has called us to do. I want to draw your attention to, to one more thing when it comes to Moses' excuses. This has fascinated me for years. Let's look at uh, verse 2 here in chapter, chapter 4. It says, Then the Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. Do you think God really didn't know what that was in his hand? God's speaking to him through the crackling burning bush. What's that in your hand? Uh, God, don't you know? What, I mean, you created the universe. You know what this is? Staff's like a big, big candy cane set made out of wood. Use the hook on the end, grab the sheep around the neck, and pull them back in line. You got the staff. Now, the way I think God has a spiritual staff, sometimes we get out of line, he'll hook us and bring us back to another sermon for another day. What's that in your hand? A staff. There's something about this staff that he's wanting to bring his attention to. What is it? God's saying, you see this common, everyday instrument that you use every day? I'm going to take that common, everyday instrument that you use, and I'm going to do great things with it. That's what he tells them. And when we look at the, the record through the book of Exodus, especially as God's bringing the people out, let me, let me give you a quick rundown of what all he was able to do with that staff. Later on, that staff was, God told him to throw it on the ground, throw it on the ground, and guess what it turned into? It turned into a snake. Took off running. Yo, what is this? I picture it as being a cobra. A cobra snake. Why is that? Well, if you look on the Egyptian's headdress, what do they have right there? A cobra. So most likely, I think we're in Egypt. That's a deadly snake. Scary. Threw that staff down, turned into a snake. Later on, uh, when God was unleashing the plagues on Egypt, he, Moses extended it toward the sky, and hailstones uh, fell, stripping the land bare, killing the vegetation. Uh, during the eighth plague, Moses held the staff out over Egypt. Swarms of locusts invaded the land. Later on, Moses held the staff out over the Red Sea, and it parted and closed. Uh, Moses struck a rock with the staff and water came out. Moses held the staff in the air and Israel defeated her foes. Those are just some of the ways that God used this common everyday instrument in a mighty way. And you may be wondering, well, okay, John, what, what's the point? Well, I'm going to ask you this morning, what has God placed in your hands? What common everyday thing has God placed in your hands? Now, we don't have to get too deep with this. Maybe it's a screwdriver. Maybe it's a hammer. Maybe it's a keyboard. Maybe it's a spatula. Maybe it's a pen or a pencil, a musical instrument, a camera. It could even be a broom or a mop. But I'm convinced that God has placed things in all of our hands. And He can do mighty things through the things He's placed in our hands. That's what He's trying to get Moses to see. He said, stop with excuses, Moses. Knock down every one of these excuses. And I can take something as common as that staff and I'm going to work great things through that staff. And I think in, 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 a, in, a, in a general sense, God can take the things that you hold in your hands 
on a regular basis and use them in a mighty way for him. All kinds of things God's placed in our hands. My question is, will you offer it to God? Or will you only offer excuses? Let's pray.